our, our message, we're going back to the book of Mark. We took a couple of weeks off for the programs. Uh, we're going through the Bible, and right now we're in the book of Mark. Today's chapter is Mark, the 13th chapter. So if you want to turn there. Uh, in Mark, the 13th chapter, Christ is coming to the end of his life. He's in his last days. And he's going to be teaching some things here that uh, uh, apparently he feels are very important because he's cramming a lot of this teaching right in his last days before he leaves his disciples, before he leaves this earth to go to be with the Father. It's part of the Christmas time. It's part of the message of Christmas is what's going to be happening to Christ in the next few days. It's the completion of that message. Uh, one of my favorite paintings, and I just saw it at the Christian bookstore this past week. Uh, it's a picture of a toddler in a carpenter shop. And the toddler, of course, is Christ. And his papa is up there working on something, and he's Bend over doing something on the floor. And uh, through the window is streaming light. And the window pane forms a cross, a shade of a cross across this beautiful little child who's playing on the floor. And without the cross, that beautiful little child coming would have done us no good. What we're going to study today as we're not we're not going to study about his death yet. That's coming in a couple of chapters. But we're leading right up to his death. And that completes the story of redemption that begins with the story of the babe born in Bethlehem. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful time of year. Thank you that we can gather together here and sing songs of praise to you. We can think about your coming to earth as this little baby. And Lord, it, uh, it breaks our heart when we see pictures of this beautiful little child knowing what he came for. He came to die according to your word. He came to die for us because we're so ornery. Lord, humble us. Help us to not be too good to bow our knee. Help us not to be too right in ourselves that we cannot come to him humbly admitting our need asking for his grace. We thank you for this service today, Lord. Be with us. Be with your word. Minister it to our hearts. Give us ears to hear. We pray this all in your holy name. Amen. Mark, 13th chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be torn down. Isn't that just like us? Isn't it just like people to be so impressed with the outward, with the buildings. The temple, as we've been studying in, uh, in past weeks in Mark, uh, temple worship had just deteriorated horribly. It became a place to make money. There were people uh, they had a little rule that the temple tax 
taxes, monies, had to be collected in a certain coin so that there were money changers in there. And if you came in, Jews came in from all the nations around for the Passover, which is, this is Passover time. And uh, they all had their cash, of course, from their various countries. And these guys would sit here at these money changing tables. You had to have a certain currency to uh, make offerings in the temple. So they would take your 50 bucks or 50 rubles or 50 francs or whatever, and they would give you about $10 worth or whatever. They just were robbing people in the exchange. Uh, also, people coming from all these distant places weren't driving their cattle before them, their sheep and lambs. They would come to Jerusalem. They would purchase an animal for the sacrifice. And of course, again, in the name of God, they were being robbed. Religion, then as now, uh, seems to sink to unbelievable lows. In a house of prayer, as Jesus said, they had turned into a den of thieves, den of robbers. Well, but, sure looked good on the outside. As they were leaving the temple area, they looked and said, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Oh, before I go on, we're going to just mention one more thing. Uh, Jesus said, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. You ever seen pictures of the Wailing Wall? There's stones on top of stones, isn't there? Uh, does that mean Jesus was wrong? Uh, Jesus was saying some the sort of thing that we commonly say. Man, the Packers really killed the Jets or whoever. The Bears. The Bears. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, no one in their right mind thinks that the Packers killed anybody. It's the way we speak. And Jesus is telling them that this thing is going to be totally destroyed. It's like I was watching an NASCAR race, and I always use this example. Uh, the announcer, there was a big wreck, and the announcer said, Oh, that car is totally destroyed. Oh, no, it wasn't. I could see it right there. There was a couple of wheels that were probably still useful. Uh, but we all know what he meant. There are, maybe I'm belab belaboring a point too much, but there are people out there that point to this, no stone will be left on another, as being an example for Jesus was wrong. Come on. Get a life. It's the way we talk. It's an expression. Let's read verses 3 and 4. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Good question, huh? Why do you think they asked that question? Well, you know, just uh, a chapter or two before, they were arguing about who was going to have the more important positions in the government that Christ was going to set up, that they thought Christ was coming to set up at this point. And now Christ is telling them that there's not going to be a stone left on top of another. This thing is going to be destroyed. And they're wondering, uh, how can this be? When could this be? Good questions, really. Let's read 
uh, 5 through 8. Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. But at the end, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. Going back there to uh, verse 5, uh, where Christ said, uh, Many will come in my name, claiming I am he. Do not believe him. Have you ever met anyone that claimed to be the Messiah? It's kind of a rare bird, actually. Uh, I had a, a library book. I was looking for it yesterday. I bought it out of, out of the Janesville Library, I believe, uh, probably in the 70s, maybe earlier than that. Uh, it was an old, torn-up government publication. And, the, and I don't know. It's interesting that the government does such things. I didn't realize they did. But it was called Messiah's. And in there, they listed over a thousand messiahs that uh, people who had come claiming to be the Christ. They gather a little group about them and uh, just, I've only met one guy that uh, claimed to be a messiah. Well, I've met two. The one I, I don't think would be counted in that because he was, uh, he was just an insane man. But uh, I met, uh, when I was a young boy, I met in Michigan City, Indiana, a man who had a following and he, uh, they all believed that he was Christ. He seemed to believe it as well. They're rare birds, but they're out there. And it's just part of... Uh, Part of what is Christ predicted is going to be going on right up till the time that uh, he returns. He talks about wars and rumors of wars. He says, don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. We've had wars all along, haven't we? Nation will rise against nation. Nothing new there. Kingdom against kingdom. Nothing new there. By the way, that the word there is ethnos. We get, the, we get the word ethnic from this word. Ethnos will rise against ethnos. Eth eth ethnic groups will, uh, not only nations, but ethnic groups will be battling. Nothing new there. That's been going on. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. Again, nothing new. These are the beginning of birth pains. Here I think we're getting a new clue. The thing that you want to remember about birth pains, uh, you'll get a pain. Was that a, was, that a birth, was that a contraction? You start watching. 15 minutes later. Was that a birth pain? 15 minutes. 15 minutes later. A little while later, those pains are getting stronger. And they're getting closer and closer together. Uh, I think we're getting a clue here. When, when all these things that Christ says here that we can look for, when they begin to get closer together and more intense, we're getting closer to the Lord's return. I saw a a graph put out by our U.S. Geological Survey. And they were uh, talking about, they, the graph was describing the frequency of uh, earthquakes measuring five and above. And the graph goes along like this, and then it starts like this, and in the 80s, and the 90s, and now the graph is going like this. Boy, oh boy. Uh, there's nothing new about an earthquake. 
There's nothing new about famine. But the frequency is, uh, this is something new. Uh, we may be, may be living in the time when, that Jesus spoke of when he said he would be coming again. Let's read uh, 9 through 13. You must be on your guard. He's talking to these four men here. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. When it, where it, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at that time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Okay, we begin. Christ begins talking to them about the persecution that they're going to experience from the Jews. And then it expands out to kings and governors. And uh, right until all the world has heard about Christ. read uh, 14 through 20. I want to get through chapter 13 today. When you see the abomination, oh boy, this is going to get interesting here. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of this house go down or enter the house or take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. I don't know how familiar you all are with scriptures, but this uh, abomination of desolation that he spoke of there in, uh, what, chat, what verse was that? 14. 14. Uh, that's a reference back to, a, to the book of Daniel. And the book of Daniel talks about this uh, character. Uh, 2 Thessalonians also talks about this character. He's called the Antichrist in the second Thess book of Thessalonians. And he stands in the temple in Jerusalem at the end times and declares himself to be God. The, uh, I'm, I'm reading out of the NIV. Most of you here, if you have the Pew Bible, it's also NIV. Uh, it says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Uh, it uses uh, it. It's also the word used there can also be he. Standing where he does not belong. And uh, there's a lot of argument over whether this is a person or, uh, or a symbol of some sort. I think it's both. Revelation tells us that uh, during uh, the tribulation period, which he describes at the end of this little section we just read, that uh, an image is erected in the temple. So we can be talking about the Antichrist declaring himself, he declaring himself to be God in the temple, or we can just be talking about this image that is made in the temple at the end times. We're not going to get into a lot of it, um, because we got into more of it when we, when we did the parallel passage in Matthew. But this is a time of tremendous persecution on the earth of Christians. It's a time of tremendous tribulation 
for the non-believer as well because God at this time is pouring out uh, judgments on the earth. This is a, uh, referring to a seven year period of time where God pours out judgments on the earth. The important thing to remember about this, in the book of Revelation we read in a couple of places that God did this, you know, he, he put this or that judgment out and it was causing horrible destruction and devastation. And it would say, but they still did not repent. The important thing about judgments, the important thing to remember is that the, the goal of punishment from God is always to bring people back, to bring people to their senses. Uh, I mentioned this last time I spoke on this subject, but Many of the leaders of our governmental leaders that are uh, limiting freedom of uh, religious expression in our schools and wherever, in our, in our public places, do you remember where they were right after 9-11? They were on the steps of the Capitol. Remember what they were doing in that government place? They were praying and they were singing God bless America. See, this is what this is what catastrophe does. This is what tribulation does. It humbles us. So where are we here? We ended up with twenty. Let's read on. 21 through uh, 27. At that time, if anyone says to you, oh, by the way, we should go back here. Um, when the people in Judea at this time, at this future time, when uh, the Antichrist declares himself God in the temple, Jesus is warning the people in Jerusalem at that time, don't go... If you're on the roof, don't go even in the house to get your coat. Get out of there. Things are really, really going to get tough. Uh, can you imagine any major city when uh, the catastrophe is about to fall? It's difficult to get out of town. Christ saying, don't wait. When you see this, when you see this fellow, uh, the... Uh, when you see the abomination of desolation in the temple where it shouldn't be, get out of town and get out of town fast. Beginning at 21 then at 227. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect if that were possible. So... Be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaking. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. When everything is falling apart, seemingly falling apart, seemingly out of control, it's in control. God is in control. And he's, he's, bringing, uh, he's bringing history to the conclusion that he's been predicting all along is going to end up where it was going to end up. There's going to be people at that time saying, uh, Christ is going to be over here. We, we, we got a guy over here. You need to come and talk to he, This is the Christ. Or this is the Christ over here. And he's going to get us out of this mess. We've got somebody here that really has got a handle on this and, and he's going to help us get out of this. No. Jesus says when he comes again, there's going to be no doubt. He's not going to be off someplace. 
He's going to be coming visibly and in power. There's going to be no doubt that he's coming. Interesting line here. He will send, verses 27, He will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Uh, literally, it means from the four points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. He's going to send his angels out. Uh, does this sound like the rapture? It does. It's very similar to the rapture. In the, if we didn't have an Old Testament, we would have to think that that was the rapture. But in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 66, a couple other places, God tells us through his prophets that at this time, when he returns to earth in power, He's going to send people out into north, south, east, west, all corners of the earth. And he's going to bring all the Jewish believers into Jerusalem. Uh, also, he says that they're going to come by various means. They're going to come on litters. They're going to come on boats, whatever. Uh, the rapture, and I don't know how many people know how much doctrine you know, but the rapture for the church is an instantaneous thing where we go up to be with Christ. This in gathering here is something that may take months or years after Christ comes returns to bring all the Jews back into uh, Jerusalem and Israel. Other differences? When we are, when Christ comes to the church, uh, we who are mortal become immortal, according to Scripture. We're given new bodies, bodies that aren't subject to decay, that aren't subject to death. But these folks, according to the Old Testament passages that describe this event, are, remain mortals. They are just mortals that are brought into Jerusalem, into Israel, into what is called the, the kingdom, that kingdom. There's two kingdoms in Scripture, by the way. There's the kingdom of God, and that includes everyone, Jews, Gentiles, everyone who has believed in Jesus Christ and are, are raptured to heaven when Christ comes uh, to take his church. And then there is the kingdom which is for the Jews. And you see both of these kingdoms mentioned in Matthew, the 8th chapter. The kingdom of God composed of everyone, Jews and Gentiles who believe in Christ and the kingdom of Israel which is composed only of believing Jews at the end times. I'm getting confusing. I know that. Sorry. But I don't want you to uh, get to confuse this passage with the rapture passages, the passages that talk about Christ coming to take his church out of the earth. Then, let's read from 28 to uh, 31. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So Christ is, uh, is just telling us here that uh, what he tells us is reliable. And that all these things he's telling us about leading up to his coming, coming that uh, they are going to happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. There's possibly, I'm going to say possibly, a uh, little parable here in verse 28. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. 
Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Um, the fig tree is, uh, is often used in the Old Testament as a picture of national Israel. It is possible that this is telling us that when the fig tree begins to um, uh, bud, yes, to get tender twigs and its leaves come out, it's possible that that is referring to the return of the nation of Israel. This is not a slam dunk at all, but it is possible. Even when you see these things happening, you know that it is near. What's near? Right at the door. Well, in the context of what we're talking about here, Jesus Christ coming to earth with, in the clouds with great power and glory. That's what's coming near in this passage. Which generation are we talking about here in, in verse 30? I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Well, if he were talking about the generation of the, the four guys he's talking to, he's wrong, isn't he? Because those guys are long dead. I think he's talking about the generation that sees these things occurring. That that generation will not pass away until it's all accomplished. If that's possible, if, that's the, if that is the uh, correct interpretation, it means that the generation that would see Israel become a nation or the generation that would see uh, the increase in earthquakes, famine, and all this that we, that we definitely have seen in our time, that that is the generation that uh, will see all these things come to pass. We don't know. So we're not going to be we're not going to be dogmatic about it. Let's read 22 now. Or need my glasses, which I've got, but they're apparently not good enough. Uh, verse 32. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on your guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It is like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each one with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. No one knows about that day or the hour. What are we talking about? Well, the, subject, the subject of this passage is the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches all through that Christ is coming again. There was a lot of prophecy concerning his first coming. It all came through, true, exactly as stated. There's far more prophecy concerning his second coming. It's going to happen. This passage says, no one knows about the day nor the hour, nor even, not even the angels of heaven. But you know, even though that scripture is there, there's been guys throughout the ages that have come up with all kinds of calculations and notions about when Christ is going to show up. Even though the scripture says no one knows the day and the hour. Uh, I mentioned last time I spoke on this subject, uh, it's kind of interesting, in 1988 there was a book called 88 Reasons. Well, I think it came out the year before. 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Come in 1988. Kind of a foolish exercise. It sold a lot of copies. Uh, Christ didn't return in 88. In 1989, he came out with a book, 89 Reasons Why Christ Will Come in 1989. That one didn't sell as well. I wonder why. We're always doing silly things. Religious folk, I'm sorry to say, are not immune. Uh, no one knows the day nor the hour, period. Yeah. 
<laughs> no one knows the days nor the hours. But right after saying no one knows about that day nor hour, not even the angels in heaven, he ends that little uh, section there by saying, keep watch. Just because you don't know the day nor the hour doesn't mean that it's something we forget about. It's something that's to stay here to inform our day-to-day -day actions, our day-to-day -day living. My Lord could be coming this afternoon. Do you think that can happen? If that thought is in our heads, do you think that might have an effect on some of the things we say to people? On some of the things that we do to people? Thirty to the end. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or whether the roost, when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Okay, in these last few verses, he's told us to keep watch three times. And he says to these four men that are that asking these questions in the first place, what I say to you, I say to everyone. Does that include you and me? Yes, it does. Watch. Now, don't be the person, please. Don't be the person who lives your daily life without regard to the fact that Christ is coming back. To judge. I'm going to say it again. Don't be the person who lives your daily life without regard to the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back to judge. If you're a believer, looking at the signs of his coming, according to scripture, will have a purifying effect on your life. Paul says, whoever has this blessed hope purifies himself. If you're a kid and mom and dad are out, you got the run of the house. And mom says, when I get come back, I want this place spotless. If you know they're coming back, 12 hours from now, how hard are you working on the house? <laughs> You're not. Good night. There's so many things to do. <laughs> if you do not know when the parent is coming home, you keep the place in a state of readiness. Um, at least you should. That's the right thing to do. And it's very similar in our lives, in our spiritual lives. Uh, God didn't tell us he's coming back in uh, 2087. Because if he did, right up to 2086, being human beings, we're going to be acting like jerks. Jesus is coming back. Keep that thought in the forefront of your mind. It affects how we live our daily lives. If you're not a believer at this time, I think most everybody in this room is a believer. If you are not a believer, if you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, remember at the beginning of this chapter in verse 2, Jesus was talking about the, the destruction that was coming to the temple. Judgment was coming to uh, Israel back then because of the way that they were behaving, because of well, it doesn't say it in, in uh, Mark, where we're reading, but the parallel passage in Matthew tells us that prior, when Jesus was coming in town there, being a prophet, knowing what was going to happen to those people in AD 70, AD 70, that they were going to, this nation was going to be completely disbanded. The city would be sacked. The temple would be destroyed completely. 
He knew this, and the scripture says Jesus wept over that city. He knew they would be wiped out as a nation and their temple would be utterly destroyed. Similarly, Christ knows what awful judgments will happen to you if you die unrepentant. He knows what will be happening what will happen to you if you survive, if we live, until the great tribulation that's spoken of at the, that comes at the end of time. He knows what will happen, what you'll go through if you enter that awful time called the great tribulation. He weeps. He doesn't want you there. And he calls you, come. Now, he tells you, uh, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. If you hear the voice of God speaking to you, telling you, okay, this is the time to get square with the Lord. Don't fight it. Don't harden your heart. And he, because in another place, he says, my spirit will not always strive with the spirit of men. There's a time when it's over, when the chances are over. God is gracious, 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 gracious. But there is a time when your choice is a permanent choice. If you've rejected Christ, you've rejected him forever, for all eternity. So this needs to be taken care of now. If you are not a believer, so I just urge that if uh, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, that you will talk to me or one of the deacons. And we'll, get, we'll get this thing straightened out. No man should go through life fearing eternal death, fearing eternal consequence for sin. Let's get it done. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step Leave your comfort zone at home. Uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area. And I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home. But we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to, to, to know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So... Uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching, but if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Hi, this is John with Foundation TV. You know, Foundation Church is a small church uh, here in Janesville. We do a lot with the size of the congregation that we have, uh, and we've been really pleased to host Foundation TV for many years. Uh, however, due to budget constraints, we're no longer able to do that at this time. Uh, if you would like to find Foundation TV, we're still available on YouTube uh, at the address below and on local access channels 98 and in HD 994. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.